Good morning and welcome to the virtual Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice and River Committee special hearing. I am joined by uh, my colleagues, Mr. Peretz uh, and Mr. Cedillo. It will be here shortly. But before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure they're on mute when not speaking. And with that, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member O'Farrell. Present. Council Member Coretz. Present. Council Member Cidio. Council Member De Leon. Council Member Kerkorian. Two members, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, in a moment, we will take public comment on items specific to today's special agenda. But since it is a special hearing, there'll be no general public comment. I'll turn it over to our city attorney now to explain the speaking rules to the members of the public who are phoning in uh, and to our city clerk to provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you'd like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total. Because this is a special meeting, we will not be taking general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or again stray off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we will move on to the next speaker. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you would like to speak on. We know the situation is not ideal and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Verano, if you could please read the instructions for the public to call in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call one six. Good morning and welcome to the virtual energy, climate change, environmental justice and river committee. Excuse me. All right, did we, uh, did we fix that little problem just then? Yes, I just had some feedback on my audio. Okay. I'll go ahead and start over, Mr. Chair. Uh, please continue, yes. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-919-4459 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are ready to now take public comment. So please bring in our first caller. Caller, please state your name and items you would like to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Estella Slotis Hamilton. I'd like to speak on all available items, please. All right, you have two minutes uh, for those items. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. So in regard to the agenda today, I want to note that items like item two, items like item two, item three to do with, item four to do with water, item two in the report actually hints to public health. So I want to note that there is an inconsistency with regard to public health policies right now. And I want to know why this meeting is so special. What are the special agenda items here? I believe that you guys are abusing the special agenda so that you don't have to have public comment. And that is a violation of the Brown Act. You guys cannot be taking these actions. Now, yesterday I went to the city hall and I was not able to come in, even though I showed my negative COVID test. The day prior, I spoke to Naomi, the city clerk supervisor. She told me all I needed was a negative COVID test to come in within 72 hours. I showed that test. It was a rapid test from home, the kind that the government sends us, and I was not in allowed inside the public building to access my First Amendment right for redress. So that is a violation of my rights. These 
meetings are not open to the public. These meetings are technically closed to the public and open to select members that you deem worthy to speak. And now you're using these special meetings to limit what I can say to you because you don't want to listen. So to the employees, the nice employees that I spoke to, I hope that you guys take account that your bosses are breaking the law and they're violating your rights as much as my rights. This could be your child, your grandma, your friends calling in and being violated, being their rights being trampled on, Thank you, caller. and being stolen. Thank you, caller. Before we take on our next caller, can we make sure that everyone is on mute? Uh, it should be everyone except the person speaking publicly should be on mute. Uh, and with that, please, uh, we're ready for the next caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, sorry. My name, uh, hi, my name is Alex Jessen. I'm calling on items uh, three, four, and six, please. All right. You have two minutes uh, for all items. Please go ahead. All right, uh, I'm calling on behalf of Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles and would like to urge this committee to be especially cautious uh, in moving ahead with the Green Hydrogen Hub proposal for the Port of LA uh, as it laid out in item four. Uh, research shows that efficiency and direct electrification are much more effective in nearly every application uh, and this option should be exhausted before any green hydrogen project is considered. Uh, additionally, projects should be scaled appropriately to fit the needs of these exceptionally difficult to electrify sectors rather than being scaled to provide excess uh, hydrogen to sectors where electrification would be preferable. Uh, even in those limited sectors where green hydrogen is an option, there are still serious uh, questions about whether this technology will actually decrease emissions in those sectors, uh, and uh, there's potential for the project to actually increase emissions. Uh, it's serious thought, <clears throat> excuse me, serious thought and consideration isn't put into preventing, monitoring, and repairing leaks. Uh, the negative effects of uh, this project on air pollution, particularly from nitrous oxides, are also not yet fully understood, uh, nor are the impacts on water quality or quantity. Uh, and there's also serious concerns about land use, especially, from the, uh, especially for the already pollution overburdened communities that will be affected by this project. Uh, in short, we don't believe that it's right to trade air, water, and land use impacts for the sake of carbon emissions uh, and urges committee and DWP to commit to adequately answering these questions before any project proceeds. Uh, I'd like to thank Councilmember O'Farrell's office for leading the effort to uh, hear from the communities that will be most impacted and for ensuring community participation in this process. Uh, and thank you all for considering these factors and look forward to continuing to engage with uh, you all on this if a proposal moves forward. Uh, as for item three, we're supportive uh, and I also want to thank Councilmember Ramon for her leadership uh, on the issue of achieving zero carbon new buildings and want to express our gratitude to our office for working uh, with our coalition to ensure that community concerns and questions could be addressed uh, through the CMO's uh, process. And then finally for item six, oh, thank you. Uh, just, we're just wearing cards, oh, sorry. That's okay, wrap, wrap up, that's okay. Okay, sorry, for item six, uh, we're encouraged to see the city uh, leading by example and the, looking to decarbonize its own building stock, while also uh, working to address historic disparities uh, and implement whole building upgrades. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to engage with you to make sure that labor, housing, and environmental justice concerns are prioritized. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. My name is Jasmine Vargas. Um, I'd like to speak on items three, four, and six. All right, you have two minutes. Please begin. Thank you, uh, esteemed chair. Um, I'm here to speak on items three, four, and six. I'm Jasmine Vargas. I'm with Food and Water Watch, Food and Water Action. Um, also part of the Repower LA Coalition. And uh, first want to speak and say I support uh, item three, decarbonization, uh, new residential buildings, and I appreciate the leadership that, uh, that Councilwoman Ramon's office and others have shown and working with the communities that will get the best um, out of the decarbonization and electrification that is coming to Los Angeles as we meet our 100% clean energy goals by 2035. But how we get there is um, just as important to 
begun, especially as we're going into a very important power planning process at LADWP in the coming months. Um, item number four, the hydrogen hub, is what I'm referring to, where the city and the DWP have been pushing hydrogen as part of our clean energy future. Um, and green hydrogen hub um, as one of the solutions for meeting that future. I wholeheartedly disagree and hope that this motion is slowed down um, and this proposal is slowed down so that communities that are going to be at the forefront of this new infrastructure that is really supposed to meet a larger hydrogen demand and therefore going to bring so much more impact to already impacted communities on the fence lines of these industrial zones. This is not an environmental justice solution. This is still environmental racism, and we shall call it as such. A hydrogen hub is not what the community wants, and just like the previous caller, we know that electrification, decarbonization, energy efficiency, and Thanks. local distribution is what's going to get us to the 100% clean energy future we deserve. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Yes, good morning. Happy uh, Cinco de Mayo. This is Joe Sullivan. I work for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 11, and the National Electrical Contractors Association of Greater Los Angeles. I am speaking on item number four. And uh, I want to express our support for a green hydrogen hub and uh, support for this motion. Um, not only will this have environmental impacts, I think it has the opportunity to create high road careers and just transition for closing down dirtier options. Uh, but we want to make sure that whatever submission is set forth wins. A lot of states are competing for this. Other states are collaborating to come together, and this needs to be a collaborative submission. It needs to be statewide. It needs to include labor, environmental justice, academia, the labs, producers, distributors, et cetera, the whole team. It cannot just be a single entity. Um, so we want to see a collaboration, and we expect the RFP to be issued from the Department of Energy soon. So I think everyone needs to be working together and steering the ship in the same direction um, as soon as possible. So thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you, Joe. And we are joined by Mr. Cedillo. We have quorum uh, and we're ready for the next caller. Hmm. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Dan Kegel. I'd like to speak on items three and four. Uh, you have two minutes. Please begin. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Kegel. Um, on Council File 22-0151, I'm on the Sustainability Committees of Greater Wilshire and United Neighborhood. Uh, and both neighborhood councils voted to file a CIS in support of 22-0151 last month, but haven't filed it yet. I support that motion myself. Zero emission buildings save money, improve health and safety, and help the environment. The city should come up with a sensible plan to require new buildings to have zero emissions in a way that is fair to both renters and owners. And the motion in 22-0151 is a step in the right direction. On council, on item number four, council file 22-0255, I chair the energy committee of the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance. We uh, um, uh, we look to the Sierra Club for guidance on some issues. The Sierra Club's policy on green hydrogen says it is a promising tool for reducing emissions in hard to decarbonize sectors like long haul freight trucking as long as it decreases emissions and is not used as a fig leaf for fossil fuels. Our committee at the NCSA agrees with that assessment feels that fuel cell green hydrogen trucks or trains on longer routes may help reduce pollution at the Port of LA and has recommended that the NCSA support the motion in 22-0255 at its meeting on May 15th. We share the concern of many fellow environmentalists that SoCal Gas will use any good news about green hydrogen as a fig leaf to fight electrification and urge the city council to guard against that possibility. Thank you. 
Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Which uh, items would uh, you like to speak on? Good morning. Yes, my name is Kimberly Orbe, and uh, I'm here to speak on item three and six. Uh, I am the conservation program manager for the Sierra Club for the Angeles chapter, and I want to demonstrate support for item three and six. Um, Two minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. So I don't have to um, express to many of you all that we know that Southern California has the worst air pollution in the United States, from gas leaks, storage facilities like Aliso Canyon, from power plants, old pipelines, from our stoves. Uh, pollution is leaking outside of our homes and it's leaking inside of our homes. Um, everywhere that it's leaking, it's polluting the air that we breathe. And polluted air has devastating impact on the health of our communities. And clean, breathable air should not be a privilege, but it's a right that we should all be entitled to. Building decarbonization is a clear citywide target and goal outlined in the LA Green New Deal. And it presents one of the biggest opportunities to accomplish its goal by advancing the building decar policy so that all new buildings will be net zero. Uh, zero carbon in our near future. Additionally, Los Angeles is getting an increasing amount of its energy from clean and renewable sources with a commitment to transition to 100% in the years ahead. We need to further this smart and healthy transition to renewable energy by making new homes and buildings all electric so that there are no fossil fuels anywhere in the energy pipeline. An investment now in the decarbonization of buildings is an investment in public health. While building electrification has promising benefits to be successful, it must be pursued equitably to ensure that all communities can benefit. And LA has opportunity to ensure that all residents have access to the benefits of electrification. Um, an equity-focused building decar policy will get LA one step closer to ensuring healthy buildings, homes, and cleaner air for all. We urge you to advance this essential policy um, on building electrification. I want to thank you all, all the council members who have put these items on the city's efforts to move our city towards um, carbon, uh, carbon zero. I am a lifelong resident of LA and I'm so proud of this city I was born and raised in and I'm so happy to see the progress that my city is making um, to meet our climate goals and I hope that you all make, take the next steps to get us there. Thank you all. Thank you, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. Please state your name and what oh. you'd like to speak on. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Eduardo Masariegos. <clears throat> I'm a resident of Los Angeles uh, in the 9th District, uh, speaking as a member of the Repower LA uh, Coalition. And I encourage and, the committee... And, with, and sir, the, sir which, I, which item would you like to speak on? Uh, item 3. Okay, uh, one minute. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I encourage the committee to pass item 22-0151, the motion from Council Member Rahman in O'Farrell's office requiring all new residential and commercial buildings in Los Angeles to be built to achieve zero carbon emissions. Building decarbonization is a necessary step towards a cleaner Los Angeles. But this must be done in coordination with community stakeholders, key labor unions, and environmental justice organizations. Repower LA fully supports energy equity and building decarbonization. We appreciate the leadership of the City Council in supporting this important measure and the powerful work being done by the Climate Emergency Mobility Office. Um, so, yeah, please pass 220151. Thank, Thank you, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Go ahead, good, state good morning. You would like to speak on. Good, good morning, committee chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Chris Hannon. I'm the executive secretary of the Los Angeles Orange County's Building Construction Trades Council. I'd like to speak in support of item number four on the special agenda. We represent over 140,000 of the best trained men and women in construction. Uh, many of our members live in the city of Los Angeles and surrounding communities, including communities uh, impacted uh, by our, our ports, uh, heavy industry, and other uh, very difficult uh, areas to decarbonize and very difficult to do it through electrification. Uh, green hydrogen is a tool 
to meet our state's uh, ambitious climate goals, uh, including the 2030 goal, and uh, equally as important, the 2045 goal, without an alternative uh, form of energy uh, similar to hydrogen, and in this case, green hydrogen, we would have a almost impossible task of decarbonizing the port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach that impacts so many. Uh, so many industries rely on reliable power generation. We need to have local power generation here uh, that provides uninterrupted power to the city of Los Angeles. And this motion uh, looks to a, um, a future of zero carbon. Green hydrogen is a, is a way to get there. I, we fully support the motion and an application for the federal grant. Uh, it will allow thank, transition thank you, thank in our areas. Thank you, Chris. It was a, a little more than one minute, so I, I have to be consistent. But, but thanks for your comments. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning. This is Monica Embry. I'm calling on items three, six, and four. All right. You have two minutes. Please begin. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, so excited to be calling in today in strong support of items number three and six. Um, the Sierra Club is proud to be advancing our building decarbonization efforts and are so proud of Los Angeles for moving forward these important efforts. I especially want to thank Chair O'Farrell for your work in advancing this on item number six and ensuring that we are having our libraries and fire stations and zoos advancing decarbonization efforts so that the city can lead with our existing infrastructure and ensure that electrification is the primary solution for addressing so many of our different infrastructure needs. Uh, secondly, on item number four on the hydrogen hub, we're calling to express continued interest to engage in conversations about Los Angeles' proposal. I also would like to thank Chair O'Farrell's office for ensuring that community groups are part of the conversation in ensuring what uh, application looks like. Green hydrogen may be a solution for our hard to decarbonize areas, and that could include heavy duty uh, issues like aviation and shipping and industry. And so ensuring that that hydrogen is truly 100% green, being made by electrolysis using only renewable energy is critical, as well as ensuring that issues around combustion or fuel cell are adequately discussed so we are not unduly burdening communities that have already been on the forefront of environmental pollution. So we think there are some ways in which green hydrogen may be the solution and really look forward to having these continued conversations as the city moves forward with this process to ensure that environmental justice groups and labor allies and academics and the entire community, as Joe Sullivan shared, are part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Go ahead, state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning. My name is Aura Vasquez. I'm a resident of Meek City, and I would like to speak on item number three. I am calling um, to express my strong support for building electrification in Los Angeles. I am a former commissioner for Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. I chair the uh, Sierra Club Climate Action Committee and also the DSA LA Climate Justice Committee. And we are very committed to see Los Angeles getting to 100% renewable. We also want to see an electrification uh, process where communities most affected as mo and most burdened by pollution are the first ones to decide how this looks like in their communities. And also, we would like to see a strong labor um, pro procurement here so that when we are retrofitting buildings our communities, people in re-entry, folks that are part of um, labor can also join these, um, these efforts. I want to applaud the efforts of Cher O'Farro and also Councilwoman Bremen for leading our city to a green and renewable place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. 
morning. My name is Francis, and I'm with the Sierra Club's My Generation campaign. I'm calling specifically on item number four, the High Street Hub motion. One minute, please begin. Awesome. Um, thanks for taking the time I'm calling to ensure that council understands that green hydrogen, while an, ex an exciting technology, still must be scrutinized. Green hydrogen is not our silver bullet to a zero carbon future. And it has no business in buildings and very limited usage in heavy duty transportation. While many of us understand that there is a resource adequacy gap for the electric sector, it's still its uses are concerning to frontline communities as burning hydrogen of any kind creates a massive local air pollution burden. LA 100's legacy cannot be zero carbon and still in an environmentally unjust Los Angeles. And further, we need to make sure that we're talking about a strict definition of hydrogen. If any project is to be approved, it must be through electrolysis. That's it. Renewable energy and water and no blending of any other fuels. Um, that's all I'll say today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Go Good ahead. morning. My name is Fernando Gaitan. I'm with Earth Justice, and I'm here to speak on items three and four. All right. Uh, two minutes. Please begin. On item three, uh, we strongly support uh, the city's efforts to explore building electrification and new uh, residential and commercial buildings. Studies have shown that all residential, uh, if all residential gas appliances in the state were replaced with clean electric alternatives, the pollution reduction would result in fewer premature deaths, fewer cases of chronic and acute bronchitis annually. This is equivalent to 3.5 billion in health benefits over a year. By some estimates, building electrification in California would result in the elimination of nearly 90 million metric tons of CO2 emissions through 2045. This is like taking 20 million cars off the road. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned previously, uh, this has to be done with robust out outreach to uh, environmental justice communities um, and uh, folks uh, really looking at out for tenants and residents living in buildings um, and doing so with robust community outreach. On uh, item number four, the green hydrogen um, proposal, I strongly recommend that the committee um, hit the pause button, if so to speak, uh, and really look at uh, these uh, proposed solutions and really examine what is meant by green hydrogen. Um, there are several reports, including one put out by Earth Justice, uh, that really showcases you know, the, the dangers of rushing into solutions uh, that are hyped by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and most hydrogen uses today are environmental justice problems. Uh, they focus on uh, solutions that the fossil fuel uh, industry is, is promoting uh, while ignoring some of the dangers uh, of mixing fuels and uh, producing uh, hydrogen. Uh, this committee must look at what is truly meant by green hydrogen before rushing into a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning, council members. Good morning, committee members. My name is Juan Nomares. I'm an advocate and activist, a friendly one, a friendly one, by the way. I'm, uh, I'm calling up item number three. Okay. Uh, you have one minute, and thanks for being a friendly activist and advocate. We appreciate uh, it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I'm calling um, because I'm a local resident, and I'm concerned about the environment, the evidence, and it's clear in California, 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the buildings we live and work in. As the state moves towards creating a clean electric grid as required by law, building electrification will play a major role in addressing air pollution and climate change in our region. And by 2031, gas burning appliances such as gas water heaters, gas dryers, and gas stoves are expected to produce more harmful air pollution such as methane and GHG emissions that, than passenger cars. And finally, decarbonization of buildings is crucial to solving the region's air pollution crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers in the queue. Thank you so much. That does conclude public comment. Uh, and colleagues, uh, Mr. Cedillo, Mr. Koretz, unless there is an objection I would like to move items one, two, 
three and five on consent. Second. All right. Seconded and so moved. Uh, Mr. Mr. Verano, if you could please call the roll. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Kretz. Aye. Council Member Cedillo. Cedillo, aye. Council Member De Leon. Council Member De Leon is absent. Council Member Krikorian. Council Member Krikorian is absent. Three ayes, and these items are approved. Thank you so much. This is to item six. Uh, Mr. Sutton Willis, if you could please read the item into the record. Yes, good morning, members. Item number six is a Bureau of Engineering report relative to developing a building decarbonization work plan for the city's existing building stock and identifying city facilities for near-term installation of distributed energy generation systems in response to council action. Thank you so much, colleagues. So much work has gone into this item. Uh, since November of 2021, when council adopted council file 21-1039, my office has been leading a multi-agency, multi-stakeholder, multi-office discussions on a weekly basis in order to get us to this point today. BOE, LADWP, and many, many others will describe in this report the methodology, the scope, <clears throat> excuse me, the scope and the purpose and transparency of uh, the process. We'll have an opportunity to appropriate over $28 million in direct climate saving work, offsetting power bills and generating clean, renewable power. This work is not easy. This work is not cookie cutter. In fact, this work has never been done at this scale and with such purpose, considering our imperative to get to 100% renewable energy in just over a dozen short years. A true collaboration between all city agencies will demonstrate that in California, Los Angeles is leading the state on how we accomplish this task. I want to take a moment to thank my friends at the Bureau of Engineering, the Department of Water and Power, General Services, Recreation and Parks, the Los Angeles Public Library, and all other departments that had a role, have played a part, and have done their jobs in responding to this council's clear imperative on the climate. It was just a few weeks ago that the UN's sixth assessment report from the IPCC was released. This latest international panel on climate change, the climate change report clearly shows that human activity is causing the planet to get warmer and it's happening right here, right now, today. It is my mission as chair of this committee to oversee the largest public works transformation in recent history, the full electrification and solarization of the city of Los Angeles. And the work will speak for itself. This process has been eye-opening and taught me, my team, and our entire city a whole lot. It's daunting, but I always wanted to know up front what were the challenges going to be. Only then can we fully overcome them. My office is working hand in hand with the Newsom administration and other state leaders in ensuring that Los Angeles gets support from Sacramento today. My last trip, trip to Sacramento just a few weeks ago, specifically before the governor's May revised budget update appeared, I made my case to his office and the head of uh, the California EPA. Los Angeles can show the state what is possible in this clean energy arena and how to do it. The state budget has over $10 billion dollars in EV funding and over $2 billion in building DCAR. Los Angeles needs that money today and right now. And we are making a very strong case for that. Why? Because in Los Angeles, we're taking, we're, we are talking the talk and walking the walk when it comes to electrification, electric vehicle master planning, solarization of city and government sites, and the elimination of gas appliances, equipment, and procurement. That's right. Tomorrow, I plan on introducing a motion that will begin the process to eliminate gas procurement across all city agencies. More to come on that one. I am excited to share the progress we have made, the work we are pioneering, and the work we're shaping right here through the work of this committee. Um, colleagues, I thank you for your commitment and for being environmental leaders as well. And at this time, I'd like to hand it over uh, to our Bureau of Engineering, and I believe 
Deborah Weintraub is going to start uh, by going over this report. Yes, uh, good morning, council members. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen, if that's okay. Um, good morning, council members. I'm Deborah Weintraub. I'm the chief deputy city engineer for the Bureau of Engineering, architect by training. We're here to give you an update on the work that we've undergone, been, been um, doing with all of our colleagues across the city to identify um, projects to uh, apply the decarbonization funding to from the 30 million that was set aside in this year's um, um, UB. And so we have a, uh, three recommendations. One is to transfer the 28.589 into uh, existing and new accounts in the Bureau of Engineering for specific projects and other costs for nine to pursue nine decarbonization, specific decarbonization efforts. Authorize the city engineer or designee to make technical corrections in order to effectuate the intent of council and authorize the city engineer with the concurrence of the Municipal Facilities Committee to reallocate project funding based on further investigations. Um, what you see on the screen is a breakdown of the 30 million. Previously, there was half a million set aside for a decarbonization work plan for the 1,200 existing city buildings. We're close to being able to issue a um, task order solicitation to bring on an expert consultant team to help us with a systematic process of prioritizing um, the city buildings for decarbonization. Previously, council also allocated money to the general services department, our partner in all of this work um, for building maintenance, staff training and supplies, and also funds for an EV master plan. Um, the projects that um, are listed here, and I will go through each one, are projects we've worked on to align the project with um, the, our sister agency, LADWP, who will be investing money um, in, in areas for in-basin generation. Um, and it's a list of nine projects. This is in your report. I'm going to go through each one, so I'm going to skip through these slides fairly quickly. And it comes to, um, as you can see at the bottom, an investment of $30 million in total. Um, since we wrote this report, um, we understand that the DWP investment may have changed, but I'll let them update you on that. I think it's, it's, it's a higher dollar number. So for each of these projects, um, we've had long discussions about trying to identify projects that align with DWP's interests, with different department interests that are public facing and that give us good opportunities to um, demonstrate the, all of the technologies for decarbonization. This one, the Balboa Sports Complex, um, is aligned with DWP's priorities for grid-connected and resilient generation systems. Brecken Parks is very supportive of this project. It's a community-serving facility. And our scope, engineering scope, will focus on building electric electrification and net energy metering um, in, in um, coordination with DWP. The next project, which is a library, the Benjamin Franklin Branch Library, working closely with the public library because they uh, have identified a list of libraries where they need to replace heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment. So that's an opportunity for us to test electric equipment and replace the old gas equipment with new electric equipment. This is an existing project in the Bureau of Engineering where we're already doing some interior uh, renovation work and some envelope work on the exterior. So it was ideal to add um, electrification, um, net energy metering, and some energy storage to this site. The next is Cypress uh, Branch Library, similar to the last, working closely with the library department. There's a potential here for roof and parking lot solar, um, for electrification, for so and for uh, energy storage systems. Old Fire Station 39 is a reuse of a historic building in the valley. Um, we've already done uh, three phases of work on this project. Our next phase will include a kitchen and uh, public community-facing amenities. So this is an ideal project for 
uh, building electrification. Um, um, we're still talking with DWP whether it makes sense to invest um, on grid connected systems here, and that investment of 2.2 million may not uh, be uh, best used here. The next project, Green Meadows Rec Center, is a project that's current that is being uh, worked on under the current Rec and Parks and DWP Memorandum of Understanding. It will be a grid connected system, resiliency generation system, and net energy metering. DOE's task will be to focus on electrification of the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system, the hot water heater, and possibly the uh, cooking equipment in the facility. The next project is a project that is already uh, in Bureau of Engineering. It's an existing building that's going to go through a complete remodel. So it's an ideal project for full building electrification. And we hope to be able to install a solar shade canopy. It's a senior center. Um, so we provide shade and, and power generation on site at the same time. The Silver Lake Branch Library, which is an existing building, the focus here will be on building electrification. Um, it's a building that was completed in 2009. It was a lead platinum facility, but there's equipment in the building that we could electrify. The Valley Plaza Recreation Center um, is a DWP project, um, a grid connected and resiliency generation system project. DWP is going to be doing 200 kilowatts of, a, of, of carport solar generation. This has a potential net energy metering installation. Um, and where DOE is going to be focused on electrification, the net energy metering. And we may need to do minor seismic and re-roofing of the building. This, this project does not include the pool facility. And then lastly, DWP will talk to you at length about uh, the LA Zoo solar PV system. We've uh, recommended allocating $8 million from uh, the 30 million. Um, this is a project that DWP is taking the lead on. And with that, I will escape and stop sharing. Um, Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. And I understand LADWP will now uh, lean in here and give us, provide additional update. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is James Barner, Assistant Director of Resource Planning, Development, and Programs. Um, can you see my screen? We can. Yeah, thank you. And uh, please please uh, begin. Okay, so the uh, LA DWP LA Zoo project has been going on for uh, several years. We are still working on the MOU uh, to complete that with the zoo. Uh, this is a grid resiliency project, meaning it includes storage as well as solar and electric vehicles. Electrification is really critical to making sure that we reduce carbon emissions in the, in the basin, as well as uh, that that was found within the LA 100 study uh, for 100% renewable that electrification was key to affordability. Uh, the project here, uh, the the key goal here is to strengthen power grid reliability. So by that we mean um, having having the ability to control the facilities. Um, solar plus the battery uh, at the facility has grid benefits for LABWP, but it also has reliability benefits or resiliency benefits for the zoo. Uh, that's including um, the uh, solar solar at the at the zoo. Uh, there's a net metering portion, um, and there's backup power for the LA Zoo. So critical uh, items within the zoo um, do will have backup power. Um, and then we're also looking at EV charging infrastructure. So just an overview, we have 370 megawatts of NEM rooftop solar, uh, six megawatt hours of, of battery energy storage at three locations um, supplying critical loads. And then along with that, we have zoo electrical improvements uh, that are needed uh, within, within the park um, to accommodate the NEM solar and battery 
the budget that uh, we're discussing today would cover these items uh, within the zoo. So this would be fully beneficial to the to the zoo. Um, as far as the grid connected portion of the project, this is the LADWP funded portion. Uh, it has a three and a half megawatt carport shade canopy. Um, that would be in the parking lot and in, in the north section of, of the of the zoo parking lot. There will also be included a battery energy storage system that would replace an existing fuel cell, um, and that would be used. That would be grid connected uh, to supply capacity for LADWP and uh, uh, reliability, increased reliability to our distribution and overall system. Uh, it included. Also is EV chargers and infrastructure. We have plans to have 100 make ready EV charging ports. So that means uh, putting in all the infrastructure so that the zoo can um, contract with a third party uh, to uh, install the charging uh, infrastructure chargers. And so they can uh, 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 increase their revenue from that. Uh, we also have 25 DC fast chargers as well. Uh, those DC chat fast chargers will um, will uh, be owned by LADWP for the first five years, uh, and then after that, they will revert uh, to the to the zoo. Um, the project benefits are substantial uh, for the NEM Solar. Um, the estimated savings for the zoo is $120,000 per year. Uh, the battery savings uh, would result in $100,000 of savings each year. Um, it'll provide the backup power, as we mentioned before. Um, and on a larger scale, that will offset fossil fuel generation overall and provide EV charging for city and LA Zoo patrons. And that would be equivalent to the uh, savings of, of carbon for 1,153 homes or 466 cars. So the uh, benefits are substantial. This is just an overview of the uh, the uh, a few of the just a few of the parts, uh, major parts of the project. Uh, the solar shade canopy, 100 kilowatts, that would be near the entrance of the, of the zoo. That would be the NEM portion. Um, that's uh, there, there are other sites within the park that would also be part of the overall 270 kilowatts. Uh, this is just one part of it. Um, the two megawatt energy storage would be grid connected. So that's uh, mostly benefiting LADWP system uh, and our distribution system. Uh, the carport solar, uh, you can see there is in the north side of the parking lot. Um, it has a condor. Uh, um, outline um, that was uh, requested by the zoo. Um, so we will we will be doing that with different shades of, of solar panels to uh, accommodate that. The overall cost here, um, uh, you can see 8 million. That's what we're talking about for today. And the investment by LADWP will be substantial. It will be $39 million uh, that we've estimated um, uh, currently so the total overall project is 47 million dollars um, what the city investment really does is it it makes this project complete so it provides a benefit to the zoo and um, makes this a, a, a complete project um, in addition to LADDP's uh, portion of it the other projects there's a couple other projects um, out of that list, uh, Balboa Sport Center uh, that we're interested in, um, that would have uh, uh, a NEM as well as carport solar, DC fast chargers and energy storage. Um, that project as, as well as the Valley Plaza Recreation Center, which is another project. Uh, each of those projects, the Balboa uh, Sports Complex would require an investment from LADW DWP of 28.5 million um, and 5.9 million for the Valley Sports Center. So with that, I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, James, thank you so much. And Deborah, thank you.
very much. Uh, I think what this tells us overall is that without investment, we don't get to 100% renewable. So we have to invest year after year, and we have to put our money where our mouth is because um, I think the the results uh, will speak for themselves uh, once we get there. And this is a significant initial investment to getting to 100% clean energy. And uh, I can't think of a better way to start than with our own city facilities. Um, first question I have, uh, the report mentions solar photovoltaic agreements are under development uh, via MOUs between LADWP and individual departments. Uh, why is this model preferred uh, over having a uniform MOU with all city departments since electrification is anticipated to be a city-wide goal? In other words, why this particular approach? And this could be um, yeah, mainly, mainly for LADWP. Yes, I think each department has its specific requirements. Um, and uh, so we found that although they, they have very sim uh, similar uh, elements to the MOU, uh, oftentimes there's uh, uh, specific uh, requirements that we need to, to meet for each one of the departments. But but I think that's a, a, a notable um, you know item to consider um, an overall MOU. So we'll look into that further. Um, but to date, that's uh, been the been the case. And I'm sure this this approach will evolve as more information becomes available. Uh, and uh, the second question I have is specifically uh, for BOE, and that is, uh, can can Bureau of Engineering provide a rough estimate of the time frame uh, that it will take to go from initiating a design to fully electrifying a building? So council member for the buildings that we've recommended here today, we have to do a great deal of more detailed investigation. So typically our projects are, it will take about three years to go from initiating design to completing construction. I'd say about three years. Which is a great piece of information to understand. So we're talking in terms of years, not months. So three years from now is 2025. And 10 years after that is our get to complete renewable energy. So we have to cook along on so many levels uh, to get to this clean energy imperative. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, that frank uh, answer. Um, question, what is this policy process teaching the city about decarb, about solar, solar photovoltaic and electrification? What do we know now after this initial analysis and outlining specific projects. What do we know now that we didn't know before? Um, Council member, are you asking me to answer that? Yeah, sure. Let's start with you, Deborah. Okay, great. So we know that there will be some space challenges um, to, uh, to identify areas for battery storage systems. They have special needs, the battery storage system. We also know that there will be some challenges in identifying good solar access locations on these specific sites, either on the ground or on rooftops. We also know that our buildings um, are different ages, different degree of um, energy efficiency. And so each of these projects is going to require full investigation. We also know that there's some um, new equipment that we're going to have to test for our heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems and for our cooking systems. Um, so these, this first group of nine projects uh, will be very important for um, starting to systematize the process. So I hope that what we understand from this first group of nine will allow us to be much more efficient in future projects. Thank you. And Mr. Pickle, we'll get to you in just a second here. I'm gonna ask the same question uh, to James at, at DWP. Yeah, I think I think uh, what we've learned over the years is that um, you know, these projects are uh, are challenging um, in coordinating these projects, and so the more that we can facilitate that with these this budget, I think will really uh, help to expedite these projects. Um, we've been doing them sort of on a one-off basis, and and uh, now we're starting to talk about 
you know, groups of projects, uh, which is very helpful in terms of workforce for us uh, to establish the workforce necessary for for doing these projects, not just one off, but projects, you know, sequentially um, back to back over the next uh, 15 years. So um, we're, we're really uh, encouraged by by um, this uh, this all expediting all of that and uh, facilitating it. Great, we're refining our approach uh, because we need to. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Pickle, a uh, ratepayer advocate, uh, uh, you uh, have, I would like you to weigh in. Uh, one of the challenges in the long term uh, with distributed generation is maintenance. And renewables are lower maintenance usually uh, but when they do have problems, like with inverters, you need sophisticated maintenance. So one of the challenges is building the maintenance staff that's able to get to these locations to address problems. Um, two, uh, DWP has a lot on its place, plate. Um, the, uh, one of the biggest things is uh, the improvement of the distribution system to handle EVs and home solar. Um, and uh, that and a bunch of deferred maintenance. Uh, so uh, that's an issue in terms of staffing, and that fits in with a third issue of um, often uh, in the past, uh, DWP's installations were more expensive than private installations. And I think a mixture of public-private partnerships uh, might be a way to proceed in this and also monitoring how we're doing overall in cost as we move forward because there's both uh, building the labor force and um, there is a private uh, labor force, uh, a good portion of it is union, uh, that is experienced in these kinds of installations. So doing, a, doing this as a mixture of uh, DWP and city employees and uh, a public-private partnership would be something to explore. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pickle. I mean, think uh, maintenance, we're, we're creating a whole new frontier here in a way, so we certainly cannot forget the maintenance piece, and that's going to have to be um, envisioned every step of the way as we stand up these, these new um, ways of generating energy with yeah. equipment that we need to become very familiar with and, and how we maintain it properly. Yes, the, the first distributed energy project was built by Thomas Edison at Pearl Street Station in South, Ma South Manhattan. And after about five years, it uh, was destroyed by fire. It was rebuilt, and then it went bankrupt in another five years. So, um, but, but it was about maintenance. So, uh, but the renewable technologies are in many ways simpler once they're installed, but they are sophisticated, and they need sophisticated maintenance. I love hearing that cautionary tale. Now I'm going to have to totally look into that. That's great. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Any, any questions or comments uh, about this item? Seeing as none, what I'd like to do is approve uh, this report. Uh, so, Mr. Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Koretz. Aye. Council Member Cidio. Council Member Cidio. Cidio, aye. Council Member De Leon. Council Member De Leon is absent. Council Member Kerkorian. Council Member Kerkorian is absent. Three ayes, and this item is approved. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, this brings us to our last item, item four. Mr. Sutton Wills, if you could please uh, read the item. Yes, sir. Item number four is a motion Martinez O'Farrell. De Leon, relative to requesting the Department of Water and Power and the Port of Los Angeles to establish a local green hydrogen hub and the usage of advanced treated water from the Bureau of Sanitation's advanced water purification facility at the Terminal Island Water Reclamation Plant in order to supply ultra-purified water, high quality, high quality water, and related matters. Thank you so much, Mr. Sutton-Willis. Uh, colleagues, this motion is extremely important, as outlined by many of the callers today. Uh, and from start to finish, our collective work in the LA uh, 100 arena 
must always be practical, practical, reachable, inclusive, thoughtful, but also bold. This motion directs two city agencies to collaborate and in coordination with a broad group of stakeholders, apply for federal funds to further help Los Angeles get off of fossil fuels. As we just heard with the last item, our city's policy on electrification and solar photovoltaic installations is robust and very complex. Uh, indeed, I, I hope you all see the hard work that city departments are doing to lead the nation in ensuring a sustainable world for the future. In fact, the city of Los Angeles is in the business of electrification and solarization as we speak. But as the LA 100 study has showed us, if we are serious about meeting the moment and curbing climate change and a heating planet, we must be, uh, it must be with an all hands on deck approach. In the surrounding communities of the Port of Los Angeles, they live with intense emissions, diesel, carbon monoxide, and oxides of sulfur and nitrogen, just to name a few. We have to mitigate that issue. This motion seeks to try and get federal dollars to clean all of it up. And, and to get there, we need to work with our partners in labor, academia, within the region and across the country. We need to make sure that hard to electrify sectors of the economy are taken into account and that we, the communities of the port area and surrounding neighborhoods are not left behind. For the past few months, especially in the days leading up to this hearing and before introduction of this motion, my office has been convening meetings with interested stakeholders and partners from all over Los Angeles. Uh, and many of them, I hope, are listening and I know are participating today. So for this hearing, I've asked folks from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, who are our collaborators on LA100, in addition to LADWP and the Port of Los Angeles to present today. And after this hearing, it's my hope that the city's intent and methodology are clear inclusive and strategic. It's my goal to clarify timelines and processes and especially to allow for a thorough discussion every step of the way. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Habib for context and then we'll go right into the presentation starting with our partners Paul Denham and Mark Ruth from NREL and then Michael Galvin and Chris Cannon from the Port of Los Angeles. And of course, again, we have uh, Dr. Fred Pickle, our ratepayer right advocate. Uh, with us today. Uh, I'd like to also hear from uh, Paul Habib and uh, Jason Rondow. So, Paul, let's turn it over to you to start with. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and in addition to our, our, um, our friends at NREL and uh, at the port, we're also joined uh, by Eric, uh, Dr. Eric Cook and Dr. Adam Weber uh, from UCLA and UC Berkeley, respectively, to uh, for the question and answer period at the end, they can provide uh, some objective uh, responses and clarity. Uh, but thank you for having us. Uh, we're we're uh, here to discuss the green hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, and the hydrogen hub motion. Um, so, in context, uh, the Department of Energy announced eight billion dollars is going to be provided for at least four regional hubs as part of its clean energy demonstration program that passed within the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, signed into law by President Biden November fifteenth of twenty twenty one. So this council motion uh, directs LADWP and the Port of Los Angeles to work together in collaboration with other partners to create a proposal to the Department of Energy to establish a green hydrogen hub in the greater Los Angeles metropolitan region. Um, it recognizes that green hydrogen can play a role towards reaching our 100% clean energy goals adopted by this council and illustrated in the LA 100 study uh, conducted in partnership with NREL. Um, so today we have uh, from NREL, Paul Denholm and Mark Ruth uh, to give us an overview of that LA100 uh, study and what green hydrogen is. Uh, and after that, Jason Rondo and I can uh, do an overview of the steps we've taken based on the LA100 related to green hydrogen, uh, what the hydrogen hub funding opportunities and timelines are, so everyone's clear about the, the next steps and what's before us. And then the port can talk about the opportunities being explored on their sectors. Um, and at the end, we'll open it up to questions and be joined, as I said, by, by our, our colleagues also from NREL and from uh, the UC system. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to NREL um, uh, to go ahead and get started with their presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Paul. 
Hi there, my name is Paul Dunholm. I'm with the National Renewable Energy Lab. I'm sharing my screen if you can see that. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do really quickly is talk a little bit about the potential opportunities or roles for hydrogen in the in-basin generation um, aspects. And then uh, Mark Ruth will also give us a little bit of an overview of you know, the basics of hydrogen, what it is, and uh, all the issues around what color should it be. So let's just start with um, kind of a reminder of the LA100 study and the focus, the fact that we, we did intend to um, look at a bunch of different scenarios based on uh, feedback from the advisory group. Um, these kind of had a breadth of issues around looking at the development of transmission, um, the speed of the transition, um, concerns about the use of things like biofuels, and then comparison to kind of the, the SB100. So one of the things that was really critical of the study was a focus on reliability and, and various aspects of reliability. So essentially, how do you keep the lights on during periods of low solar, low wind, very high demand um, as, as temperature increases and air conditioning demands will increase. We expect to see you know, those, those hot days where everybody's got their air, air conditioner cranked up. And then, of course, issues like transmission outages, um, especially under the increased uh, presence of wildfires. Um, so we expect uh, you know, larger incidences of, of you know, times where there may be outages due to wildfires. So the really the, the reason why we focused, or I wouldn't say focused, the reason why this keeps coming up, the, the issues around hydrogen and particularly in-basin generation is these three issues. Essentially, what are the supply side challenges of meeting a 100% renewable energy system? Um, the first is when there's just not enough renewables. Um, and the second two, really, the, the second is, is how do you get these renewables into the basin with transmission and then kind of getting that uh, energy or electricity around into the right places in the basin. So, the, so items number two and three are really around transmission. So the point of this graph is to show that, you know, not to get you know, overly technical here, you can think about this as all those blue dots are periods in which, um, quite frankly, it's pretty easy to meet um, LA100, or LA's demand with renewables. And those blue dots, there's a lot more of those blue dots than there are orange dots. And the orange dots represent to periods where it's going to be a lot harder um, to get the energy from renewable energy. And um, the point is that if you think about um, the extended period from basically from February through June, um, you're not going to need in-basin uh, generation. You can import all of that renewable energy. You can rely on your in-basin um, solar energy. And it's really the period in kind of the summer um, in where those orange dots are. And again, this is just uh, you know, illustrative of the fact that there are some days where it's going to be challenging to deliver all of the energy needed from, from renewables. Not Maybe not that many, but there will be some. But really the biggest challenge, I think, is, is around transmission, because we can find additional solar resources, we can find additional wind resources to maybe address some of these mismatch issues. But it really comes down to the fact that we need transmission. Not only do we need transmission to deliver energy from all of those out-of-basin resources, the wind, the large-scale solar, um, we need that, that transmission um, to, to deliver that energy, plus, of course, the, the hydro resources that and the geothermal resources that LADWP either has under contract now or will develop in the future. So we're really de deriving a very large amount of our electricity from these out-of-basin transmission uh, resources. And again, transmission fails. So the, the second aspect of this is, again, the problem is LADWP system was designed around the ability to deliver energy from um, these thermal plants on the south side, essentially the OTC units that, that we've been talking about for 10 years. Um, all the transmissions coming in from the north, that's great, but to deliver that energy to the south side of the, the system, um, you're relying heavily on a limited capacity transmission. And if that transmission fails, um, that's why, that's a big part of why LADWP currently relies on those three units on the south side of the city. Um, you know, again, as a backup for that transmission. So transmission breaks. And if we continue to rely on you know, transmission to, to deliver energy from out of basin, um, and, and again, we have increased instances of wildfires, you're essentially going to need redundant transmission. You're going to have to basically rebuild um, the entire transmission network um, if you don't have something in basin and particularly available on the south side of the system. So we're looking for a technology that is available 
um, to deliver energy for extended periods, you know, days at a time, when transmission breaks and needs to be repaired, um, when when you know there are periods of low wind and solar, and it also needs to be deployed in the right places. And and that's again, that's that's primarily um, near and around those existing OTC units, because again, that's what, how the system was designed. You could redesign the system um, from an electrical engineering standpoint. LADBP knows how to do that. If you ask them to re completely redesign the system to not be rely on those sites, they'll do it. Um, you're just going to need to rebuild the transmission system. Um, and you know, good, good luck with that in a sense. Um, so we really need something that can address all these challenges, some, some kind of technology that we can deploy in basin, that we can deploy in specific places in the basin. Of course, it has to be renewable and it has to be available for extended periods. So this isn't a six hour problem. This is a three day problem or, or maybe even a four or five or a week uh, long problem. That's that's the challenge that we were faced with with LA100, and quite frankly, utilities around the country and around the world are faced with. Um, this isn't unique to LA. Um, it is you, It is just a simple fact that in, in urban areas where, that depend on transmission, you need something to back that transmission up, and it needs to be available for days at a time. So this leads us down to you know, a, a variety of technology paths, but one of them is this particular pathway, which is producing a storable fuel that, that can be stored and used at a later time. And you need to think about how it's going to be stored. You need to, have to think about how it's going to be delivered. And then, of course, you have to think about how this fuel is going to be converted back to electricity. Um, so this is where um, I'm going to transition and have uh, Mark Ruth talk a little bit more about um, the, the, the hydrogen uh, potential pathway and a little bit about what hydrogen means. But I just want to um, you know, kind of point out the fact that across all of the LA100 scenarios, we did build this in-basin capacity on the right side of the screen. Um, we, you know, we, we uniformly built this in-basin capacity because once we did the analysis, the reliability analysis to identify uh, the, the need to maintain reliability and, and under transmission outages, we, we ended up building this uh, in-basin capacity. So with that, let me um, turn it over to Mark Ruth, um, and he can talk a little bit more about what hydrogen is, um, what it means, and the different colors. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to the council and LADWP for asking me to be able to provide some information here. Paul, should I take over the, the driving or I'll let you drive? Uh, um, whatever you'd like, whatever works for you. I'm fine with you driving. Sure. Uh, so uh, Paul talked a lot about you know the needs and the, and the reason why we're even discussing these uh, the thoughts around hydrogen. Hydrogen is obviously, according to, uh, as Paul noted, just one of the many options that are out there, but it's a lot, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of discussion around hydrogen today. Uh, I was asked to kind of go back and give you a little bit of a background on hydrogen for those of you who might want to try to remember some high school chemistry. It's the smallest and simplest element. If I think about electricity as moving electrons, then hydrogen is moving protons. It's moving that other item around, uh, essentially the other, the other piece. And it's also the most abundant uh, element in the universe which is then used in fusion to be able to generate the, our primary source of energy, energy from the stars. So hydrogen is something that exists, exists in a major way today, uh, as you all know. Uh, but in, the, in our Earth, on our Earth, in our world, it's, it, hydrogen is contained in more complex molecules. For example, as you can see on the bottom, the water molecule there is two hydrogen atoms plus an oxygen atom. A glucose molecule contains uh, 12 hydrogen atoms with six carbon and six oxygen atoms. These are very common. Hydrogen is tied up in other things today. So it's something that took a long time for society to discover and a long time for us to really understand how to be able to use. You can see that industrial era is when it was discovered, although it took almost 100 years from the day hydrogen was discovered to the time that somebody actually figured out what it was and that it was something different. And that, that, and that Henry Cavendish came up for, with that. And the reason why is that Again, like electricity, we're thinking about it as, a, as an energy carrier. What's happening there is hydrogen doesn't exist on its own very often, as you can see in the more complex molecules, but it can take, it can be taken apart from other molecules, be transferred like electricity is, and then used for specific purposes. Uh, electrolysis is splitting of water. That was discovered in 1800, soon after fuel cells, which is putting the water back together, getting the energy the energy out uh, was discovered. And uh, Jules Verne, for those of you who are old science fiction fans, wrote a great book around hydrogen and hydrogen economy, so, something that kind of gives you a vision and a dream from 150-ish years ago. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Paul. Um, hydrogen is 
a lot of discussion today. It's thought of as being very small today, but it's really a very large part of the energy economy. Right now in the U.S., we use about 10 million metric tons per year of hydrogen per day. Probably almost half of that's for oil refining, and most of the other half is for ammonia production. To put that into context, we use about two quads of natural gas, or two quadrillion BTUs of natural gas to be able to produce that. That's 2% of the total energy use in the U.S. today. So what that tells me is that hydrogen is well known and well used, at least in industrial circles around the U.S. It's not something that's completely brand new. We know something about it. And in fact, in the U.S., we have 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipelines, including some in the L.A. Basin, around 40 miles in the L.A. Basin. To, and those those connect hydrogen production from sea methane reforming to some refineries nearby. So at least from a safety standpoint, we have some experience as a society in terms of how to use hydrogen. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Paul. Yeah, thanks. So what's growing uh, it today? And you can hit that a couple, two more times, Paul. What's, why is hydrogen growing today? Why is there a recent interest? Well, there's a huge amount of growth in a and electrolyzer demand and electrolyzer plans. You can see in 2021, we had about uh, 1.7 megawatts of electrolyzers installed. And the announcements that I'm seeing lately get us up over 40 by 2030. So that is a 20 fold increase uh, or greater than that by 2030. And the reason why is that now we are thinking about very low cost renewable electricity. Instead of doing something that doesn't make any sense, like making electricity out of natural gas and then making hydrogen from that electricity electricity where which doesn't make sense because you can go directly from natural gas to electricity or to hydrogen more efficiently we're now seeing this as an application and there's a lot of interest in terms of ways to be able to utilize underutilized electrons ones that are made when the uh, wind and solar generation exceeds load you can produce hydrogen from it and then you can use it for some of those applications that you see elsewhere that's leading to large investments large opportunities and so there's a lot of uh discussion and this really led to the doe hydrogen hubs and an opportunity where do where does the u.s fit in there what are the opportunities to be able to decarbonize that last 10 percent that those hard to decarbonize sectors and provide energy storage is really the thinking around that next slide paul and so DOE is really focused on investing not just on one piece of the, of the system, like making hydrogen using uh, electrolysis or any other technology, or utilizing hydrogen for specific end uses. But the real goal of the hydrogen hubs is to be able to think across the make, move, use, and store. So making it in ways that are, that are carbon efficient, using in ways that there aren't really other applications for electrification that or that they're very expensive, and then finding ways to be able to deal with the temporal and spatial differences, moving and storing hydrogen to be able to address that. That's the focus of the hydrogen hubs is trying to think across all of those areas and where that fits into uh, developing a full hydrogen system to be able to provide support and needs where where where, uh, where electrification doesn't isn't exactly the right answer for economic or other other reasons. So my last slide, and sorry about the color change on here a little bit. It looks like uh, in changing formats, we lost some colors. But this is carbon intensity on the y-axis and different technologies kind of on the x-axis across this. DOE's moved away from using the words, using the colors, and I think much of society is moving away from using things like gray, blue, green, pink, hydrogen, because there's lots of different definitions there. They aren't necessarily connected to reality and what we're really interested in. And instead, talking about life cycle emissions. And here I talk about CO2 equivalent or greenhouse gas emissions, but obviously NOx and SOx and other emissions are also critically important. But to give you an idea on that, when people talk about gray hydrogen, they're talking about reforming natural gas, steam methane reforming, what's done today. And its emissions, as you can see, that left-hand bar are right around 9 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen produced. That's what's done today. It's greenhouse gas intensive. It's a problem. It's a challenge. If you move three over to the right, you get steam methane reforming with carbon capture and sequestration, or SMR with CCS. That you can see our estimates, including the upstream greenhouse gas emissions uh, of getting the natural gas out of the ground, getting it to, uh, and getting it to the to the reforming unit, and then reforming it, are somewhere between about two and a half and five kilograms per kilogram, depending upon how leaky your natural gas system is and what other issues there might be there. So we've got some emissions there. If you go to green, uh, green, especially if you're using solar or wind electric electricity to be able to run hydrogen as is shown in the first green block, you have essentially no emissions. There's a few emissions from generate from producing the solar unit, the solar uh, PV panels, 
producing the wind turbines, producing the electrolyzers, but there's essentially no emissions from there. <clears throat> Likewise, tank hydrogen or nuclear hydrogen with either high temperature electrolysis, HTE, or low temperature electrolysis, LTE, is, is very low. It's a little bit higher because of all the concrete and everything else that goes into building the nuclear power plants, but, there, but it's very low. And then biomass gasification has some has some life cycle emissions as well due to farming, uh, the farming practices to be able to grow and then harvest that biomass as well as some losses of CO2 that aren't captured and sequestered. So you get some emissions from that. But this gives you an idea in terms of some of the ranges and some of the greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the reasons why I heard some of the speakers talk about the importance of going to green if you want to get to a full, a fully decarbonized economy. With that, I think that ends my slide deck, and I'd like to open it up for questions or discussion or comment. Actually, uh, I thought we were going to do all the presentations and do questions yes. at the end. But yeah, let's, let's, okay. let's do all the presentations. And Mark, I especially love the reference to Jules Verne. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump in there uh, here next with uh, Jason uh, Rondu. Uh, let me just get my... Uh, screen to share if it wants to cooperate and it doesn't let's try this again okay this should work and it's the end of it which is great Okay, I'll turn it over to uh, Jason Rondu from, from my colleague here at DWP to, to start, go ahead. Great, and then we'll do the port after this. Correct. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Paul. Um, so uh, Jason Rondu, Director of Resource Planning, Development and Programs. And I, I, I only have a few slides here um, that are really dedicated to recapping uh, the parts of the LA100 study that were really relevant for our discussion today. Um, uh, Dr. Denholm did an excellent job of uh, sort of bringing us through why we care about this at all. Why are we interested in this at all? And, and that's really important to understand, um, but it's also important to understand some of the high level outcomes from the LA100 study because a lot of this ties back to what we're trying to do today. So we know that 100% renewable energy is achievable through multiple pathways. But we also know, and this is extraordinarily important, that building and transportation electrification is key to affordability, but it is also key to local air quality emissions. Uh, by far, the, the, the largest contributors to lower, local air quality uh, uh, emissions include uh, buildings and, and transportation as well. So not, not only does LADWP in the city of Los Angeles have the ability to decarbonize the power sector, but we have a, a, a role in ensuring reliability and resilience uh, uh, with respect to enabling building and transportation electrification. We also know that this will create a substantial amount of jobs. This overall transformation uh, will include job creation and, and also uh, a very significant level of high road job creation. We also know that it's technically achievable by uh, 2035 and that there are common areas of investment across all pathways. And one of those is local capacity. So the ability to deliver energy at all times of the year, under all circumstances, under uh, high heat days, under days where we have wildfires that impact our import capability. Uh, you heard from Dr. Denholm that it's not just about getting power to the city. It's about getting power to the parts of the city that, um, that need that power. So we all, I think, are very familiar, just really quickly before we move on to that slide. Um, uh, we are all familiar with a lot of the elements that are listed here. Uh, when we talk about renew renewably fueled uh, uh, dispatchable turbines, we talk about solely green hydrogen. Uh, what the study found is that under all scenarios, we need to have some type of capacity, whether that's biofuels, whether that's uh, natural gas with renewable offsets. But none, uh, I think LADWP has significant reservations about utilizing natural gas with renewable offsets as well as biofuels uh, for the reasons that we had previously talked about. And so when you talk about the last 10% or even the last 1%, uh, the LA100 study was not the LA 
75 study or the LA 90 or the LA 95 or 99 study. It was the LA 100 study. And that's where uh, the utilization of dispatchable turbines, especially uh, locally, is incredibly important. And it's not just to provide reliable power for the city uh, and ensure that we have uh, power throughout all circumstances, but it's also to make sure that we can uh, enable the local air quality emissions reductions uh, on the transportation sector. So what do we do when we found out this, this takeaway from the LA 100 study? So in addition to accelerating renewable energy distributed resources and all of that, we also started to explore what we needed to do uh, with respect to our local in-basin generation uh, fleet. So we know um, that the utilization of this uh, resource in the future will be extraordinarily lower um, by by a factor of probably about 30 times lower than the way that natural gas is used today. So we're not talking about replacing natural gas with uh, green hydrogen. We're talking about utilizing something entirely different with entirely different utilization patterns. Um, it also is extraordinarily important for us to learn more about what green hydrogen is. You, you saw a lot of excellent information uh, from Dr. Ruth. Uh, in addition to that information from the National Renewable Lab, we want to know what the industry has available today. And so we, uh, last year, uh, released the green hydrogen RFI. And what we found from that, and we're still sort of uh, working on the overall report and the overall takeaways, is that uh, we, we saw responses from 26 different companies, uh, about 20, uh, 36 overall uh, uh, submissions. But what this tells us is what the industry sees that's available today and what is available on the horizon going forward. And it helps us answer a lot of those really important, outstanding questions uh, that we have going forward. I just got one more slide and then I'll hand it over to uh, Paul. Uh, we know from the LA 100 study how important that last mile is um, in terms of ensuring that we have reliable and resilient power. Um, green hydrogen can play a really significant role with that. And we've done a lot of the work and we've got a, a huge amount of resources available to us through the NREL study and with the green hydrogen RFI. Combine that with the potential use of green hydrogen with other parts of the city, uh, whether it be the port, whether it be the airport or other departments within the city, and even industry outside of the city of Los Angeles family, um, we think that we are really well positioned uh, to uh, seek uh, uh, federal funds on this. So I think this is probably a good segue to Paul to talk about that opportunity. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to just kind of keep this brief. But, but as I said, that they've announced a, a potentially uh, – Eight billion dollar for uh, up to four hubs. Recently, they kind of uh, updated that and said it was going to be maybe six to twelve hubs. It's a little less money. There's a fifty percent match component. So if they give you a billion dollars, they expect you to locally match that with a billion dollars of private or public funding. Um, and then when they start ex uh, expending funds, um, it would be have to be spent within five years with a goal that you have created a long lasting economic structure that will sustain itself after this funding is used. Uh, the other goal of this is currently uh, green hydrogen uh, can be cost prohibitive. Um, it's over $5 per, kil per kilogram right now. And the goal is at the end of this to bring it down so it's cost effective, something closer to $2 per kilogram, which allows um, a much more robust, robust off-taker uh, use. Um, why LA uh, is important is we fit a lot of what the, the DOE is looking for. Uh, one of the hubs has to be based on renewable energy, and that is our focus. It's 100% green hydrogen only. That's all we're looking at to do. Um, uh, so that fits it. They, they also want it to geographically based, and I think we have a very strong case here in the West Coast. Um, the other is uh, we meet, uh, they want at least one hub to, to focus on power generation sector. We believe we meet about three of these. We, we know we, we can meet the power generating sector. We know that we meet the transportation sector and the industrial sector partnering with the port. Um, and, and, and both uh, LADVP and the port have already been exploring um, uh, projects related to this to reduce our emissions and meet our, our mandates and goals. Um, and if we can get this additional subsidy from the federal, uh, government, it really makes us much more cost effective and, and less of a burden on our ratepayers. That's why uh, this is very important. And there's a huge labor component here, uh, creating jobs, keeping uh, good labor jobs uh, moving forward. So timeline, uh, as, as Jason mentioned, we did our own DWP uh, green RFI 
uh, back in August, and, and we got the results and we're reviewing them now to do a, a report uh, soon. Um, the timing is very good. Uh, it, after this infrastructure uh, bill was passed in 2021, um, they released an RFI in, in February um, and asked for feedback on what people thought the RFP should look like. And we uh, partnered with the Port of LA and the mayor's office to respond and, and indicated our strong uh, preference that they focus on green hydrogen from renew renewable energy. Uh, and that there'd be also funds available to extensive outreach engagement around environmental justice in our local communities. Um, and while we're waiting on the RFP, um, which will provide, we're, we're still waiting on the RFP right now, which will provide the scope of the requirements. So the legislation requires them to release an RFP within 180 days after it was signed, which should be by May 15th. So within about two weeks, they should release the RFP. Um, we don't know how long they'll provide to respond, but we know that um, they have to select hubs within one year after receiving all the submissions. So uh, that's what's in front of us right now. We know an RFP is coming out. We don't know what the, the wording is yet, uh, but we know it's fast approaching. And the motion's directive is to build a, uh, an inclusive green hydrogen hub working with producers, users, collaborators, um, the UC system, labor groups, environmental uh, stakeholders, uh, and, and that's what we intend to do. Um, while we've been waiting for the approval of this motion, we have started working on that intent by having preliminary discussions with many of those, as many interested parties as possible, uh, including our state uh, officials. Um, and while we do not have a final project scope at this time, we do believe we have all the elements to create one. Uh, we've joined the DOE Hydrogen Matchmaker website that connects you with, with uh, various companies who are already looking to invest in producing and delivering green hydrogen to Basin. And we've confirmed significant interest from dozens of off takers uh, that can sustain the green hydrogen economy moving forward. And the port will shortly discuss some of that. Um, but the actual work of the RFP is still before us. Uh, we, we, while we do not know what, the, what will be the, required in the final RFP release, the RFI uh, in February gave us uh, a lot of hints to their thinking. They now envision providing funds in two different launches, hubs that are more advanced and with more defined projects would submit concepts in the initial launch uh, where more money will be provided. Uh, for those that are interested but not quite there yet in assembling a hub concept, there'll be a second launch with a little less money uh, next year. Uh, so it's key to us that we're in that first launch because we want to maximize the amount of federal funds available. But what we really like about this approach is they also broke up the RFP application process into two phases. The original bill language puts a heavy focus on creating hubs in partnership with labor and with a focus on, on environmental justice. And this phase approach appears to recognize these projects cannot move forward until there is a substantial labor and community outreach and engagement process. Um, it can't just take place in a few months after the RFP is released in May. So they're now envisioning a first phase where a group of ac applicants are shortlisted and given seed money in the range of one to four million dollars for planning and outreach and engagement and that can last up to 18 months at that time you know we would envision using that time to have uh, conduct workshops and community meetings direct engagement with stakeholder groups to define the final project scope and then submit uh, at that time the doe would review those proposals and narrow it down again and award the final construction dollars to the best proposals so we're waiting on the May 15th language um, to tell us what exactly is there, um, but uh, that's the overall process. And I'll turn it over to the port, who's been a great partner in this, uh, to talk about uh, their, their potential part uh, in this. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Jason. So we're gonna lose quorum in eight minutes. I oh. say that, and I'm gonna have, I've narrowed down my questions to one, but we lose quorum in eight minutes. Uh, so I'm hopeful we can speed everything up. Thank you. Paul, do you want to go ahead and stop sharing, and then I will share? Uh, if I could figure out how to do that, I would. Mr. Mr. Chair, one thing you can do is you can run the roll before the uh, comment. We used to do that in the legislature, so we can run the roll and not have to shorten it. It's a really, imp as you've indicated, an extremely important conversation to have. But, uh, you know, as, as you said, we're going to lose quorum, and so perhaps you could run the roll. Or, I, or you could have, you, I could cast my vote, and then it can be as part of the record. I'll tell you what, if, if the port can do the presentation in within six minutes, we'll, we'll take the vote then, and then I'll ask my question after that. Okay, fine. Well, just, just for the record, I don't think you have my vote until I've had a chance to have a, a detailed discussion on this issue. 
All right, well, that does it. We'll have to then just run out the clock and uh, we'll figure out how to advance this uh, from there. So uh, please, please proceed. If you're able to let Mr. Cedillo vote and, and then continue no. the discussion, I'd be happy to do that. No, let's, let's go on with the port report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike Galvin. I'm uh, leading the effort on the Hydrogen Hub Partnership uh, with DWP from the Port of LA. Uh, Chris Cannon is with us as well, our Director of Environmental Management and Chief Sustainability Officer. Chris is gonna take the first part of this to talk a little bit about the policy overreach that relates to how the port sees this as a real leverage point to be able to meet uh, our needs in getting to zero emissions, both on our terminals and off our terminals with on-road trucks in the next seven and a half to, uh, to 12 and a half years. And so Chris will go into that detail, then I'll talk a little bit about hydrogen and how it will affect the way that we're having. Uh, handling cargo here in the port and how the, the trucks are handling cargo in and around the region. So, Chris, you want to jump in? Sure. Why don't you go to uh, the slide? Uh, keep going. I'm going to, in the interest of, of uh, expediting this, I'll try to go quickly. Go to the next one. So, I can speak from this one and I'll, I'll have all my comments from this one. We at the Port of Los Angeles have had a lot of success with our Cleaner Action Plan. It's been going on since 2006. We've had dramatic reductions in emissions and uh, criteria pollutant emissions, uh, not as much with uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and so in 2017, we had a, a cleaner action plan update. We really turned our attention towards zero emissions. We set zero emission goals for ourselves for cargo handling equipment by 2030, for drage trucks by 2035. And we told ourselves that we really needed to, to focus on trying to decarbonize the port even more generally. So um, all the source categories, ocean going vessels, heavy duty trucks, cargo handling equipment, locomotives and harbor craft are all areas where we really need to think of how we can reduce our greenhouse gas uh, uh, footprint and reduce the use of, of combustion based um, uh, carbon based fuels. So, um, so far, we, we've always been uh, fuel neutral. We've been working with both uh, battery electric equipment as well as hydrogen uh, fuel cell equipment. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, success thus far with testing, um, or we've had initial success, I guess, better way of saying, with testing fuel cells for on-road trucks and cargo handling equipment. We're in discussions with harbor craft manufacturers for fuel cell working with a uh, tugboat. We're also having discussions about uh, locomotives and fuel cells there, uh, but we really need to move quickly toward development of zero carbon fuels that can be used for ships. Um, we're currently having discussions with ship engine manufacturers and ship builders about decarbonization of ship fuels as part of our green corridor efforts with C40 and the port of Shanghai. Um, those manufacturers have said they're considering hydrogen as a potential fuel and we're willing to have the discussion um, due to the urgent need to identify zero carbon based fuels. But as part of those discussions, we very much want to uh, have questions answered about the use of the hydrogen as a fuel, including assurance that it'll be generated in a green process and that emissions from the hydrogen can be controlled and will not cause new problems. So um, generally speaking, um, we support, uh, we believe hydrogen has a lot of promise, uh, but still has a lot of questions that need to be answered. Uh, we think that the goal of decarbonizing the port is urgent enough that we need to have these discussions. We need to move forward and we need to consider the potential use of hydrogen, especially with fuel cells, but also for others. So I'll stop there and go toward Mike. Thanks, Chris. And uh, he got to some of the issues related to hydrogen and how it applies well within the port. Uh, I think two issues that really tra both transition uh, for the port, being able to make sure that we retain our workforce and then the performance and the resiliency side to make sure we're able to continue to compete and be as efficient as possible. So hydrogen provides that from a uh, from a performance perspective, it's very comparable to, to what diesel does. From a driver perspective, very comparable. And so what we want to make sure is that we have a good transition of the huge labor base we have in the trucker community, as well as with the LW to make sure that everybody can use the equipment that comes to the marketplace for this. It transitions very well. It performs very much the same as diesel equipment. So we like that about hydrogen. We're currently looking at various hydrogen projects that are going to go through our technology advancement program. Uh, we, we currently have projects right now with uh, on-road trucks as well as cargo handling equipment and fueling stations that are being built uh, for both of those. 
And this is going to take it to the next level to look at other areas in, in and around the port logistically uh, in order to provide fuel and also to demonstrate another cargo handling equipment. This will be coming up in the next year as we advance. Uh, and looking forward, we continue to use these demonstrations to show the market capabilities of hydrogen, to incite commercial entities to build out the hydrogen uh, equipment that we need uh, to take this to the next step. Uh, extremely important that we continue to work with the entire coalition here and being able to build up the infrastructure so that we can deliver hydrogen in an efficient way and at a cost that is going to make it competitive to make this transition successful. So I'll move on from there and be ready for questions. Good job, Mike. Mr. Chair, Mr. DOI. What? Um, so we're about to lose quorum, but it looks like we might have the votes. So what we can do is we can go ahead and take the vote, and then Mr. Koretz uh, and I can ask our questions. We can, we can, in other words, we can continue the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you like me to call the roll? Yes, please. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Koretz. A somewhat premature aye. Council Member Cedillo. Cedillo, aye. Council Member De Leon. Council Member De Leon is absent. Council Member Kerkorian. Council Member Kerkorian is absent. Three ayes, and this item is approved. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask the questions. And thank you for all the presentations. Really appreciate it. A lot of work went into that. And so uh, I just, just know that. Uh, we're very appreciative of that. So uh, my qu first question will be for DWP and the Port of Los Angeles um, with expectation of a very collaborative process, not just between agencies and academia, uh, with, with outside, the outside world, such as labor partners, community-based organizations, environmental justice and other organizations. This so far has been the convener for most of these conversations. Um, can the LADWP and the port describe uh, how you've been informed uh, based on outreach. What sort of outreach have we done for port adjacent communities? Of course, I'm most concerned with Wilmington residents and Port of LA residents, um, many of whom never ever call in or listen uh, to what's going on, but we have to absolutely look out for, for their needs uh, despite that. So if you could uh, comment on outreach and, and uh, what, your, what your experience has been. Uh, maybe I'll start and, and just say that, that we do an awful lot of outreach for all of our projects. Um, we've been testing hydrogen fuel cell technologies for the last few years and, and certainly have talked to um, the various groups about the fuel cell technologies. We continue to have those discussions. As we transition toward other types of use for hydrogen, we're really just getting started with that outreach, and that's critical. Um, we can't go further without support from um, adjacent communities, environmental justice groups, and so forth. So we are, to, to, as far as we're concerned, that's got to happen right away. Uh, even in order to be able to submit a, a hydrogen hub application, we need to have broad-based support, and we need support from those groups. And so um, we need to have those discussions now. I can add uh, from the LADWP perspective, um, we, uh, through the LA100 effort, had an advisory group that was engaged for several years of leaders in the city, uh, from the environmental justice uh, organizations to academia and, and several others. We have a similar uh, effort going on with our power plan today. Um, and we also kicked off last summer our equity strategies effort uh, where we're engaging community-based organizations to prioritize equity outcomes. But I think a, a situation like this is going to call for us to go a, a significant layer deeper in, in making sure that we are uh, engaging uh, the right entities in the right locations. Um, this is for many people, and I think you heard uh, the comments today, um, a lot of this is new and people don't yet understand why LA and why LA did we care about this at all and why there's a huge nexus between this and reliable power and a huge nexus between this and, and decarbonization of the transportation and uh, building sector. Uh, so we have done a lot of work in that regard, um, but uh, there's a lot more that's going to have to come. And I think a lot of that will start to shape up once we see uh, what the specific opportunity looks like with, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the DOE 
um, but we are also extraordinarily uh, grateful to um, uh, to those folks who have proactively reached out to us, including your office, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell, as well as well as many of the community-based organizations that have also reached out to us. So there's a lot of work to do here, uh, no doubt about it, because this is an extraordinarily complex and important issue. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jason. Um, I, I, I so appreciate that you you understand um, what's you know. All, what all is involved in terms of, of local advocacy in relation to this issue. If green hydrogen is adopted, fully replacing diesel and other fossil fuels in hard to electrify industries, what are the impacts to greenhouse gas and other particulate emissions such as nitrogen or sulfur oxides? Well, if it's green hydrogen, First of all, it must be green hydrogen. And I thought that the uh, presentation showed uh, very nicely how green hydrogen really does have minimal uh, greenhouse gas impacts. Um, that part is good. Um, and so the benefit for greenhouse gas is, is quite significant. Um, in, in, in simplest terms, hydrogen doesn't have a carbon molecule in it. And so it, you, you don't generate CO2 emissions. However, um, dep and it depends upon um, its use. And, and a lot of the reasons that people are asking questions about hydrogen have to do with um, the use of hydrogen as a, as a fuel to burn, um, and even ammonia, which is, is a derivative. So, so when you burn hydrogen, um, as opposed to using it in a fuel cell, you do generate emissions, uh, most notably NOx, uh, but there are, are other types of emissions that occur. So when I said that we need to answer questions about its use and about the impacts, those are questions that need to be answered. So far, we've heard good things about the idea of controlling NOx and so forth, but it's very early in the discussion. And those discussions need to be asked. Also controlling the storage of hydrogen and, and uh, leakage and impacts associated with leakage, um, even safety issues all need to be answered um, as part of these early discussions. Again. So far, we've heard good things, but we really need to learn a lot more, and it's early in the discussion, very early. I'd be vigilant. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Chair. I, I thought it'd be fair to kind of turn that a little bit over to our, our colleagues from the, the UC system as well to, to get, because I agree with that. Uh, you know, what we're, what our understanding is that we uh, will absolutely, uh, the technology exists for us to ensure that we don't exceed today's stringent requirements on NOx emissions. Uh, moving forward, uh, but I, I would like to kind of hear from, um, you know, our, our, the more objective folks here that we have uh, to, on the subject, either either uh, Mr. Dr. Hook or Dr. Weber. Yeah, thank, thank you, Paul. Um, we, we definitely agree uh, with that in that, you know, the current levels and the, and the current requirements that we're looking at are going to be an absolute ceiling that we're never going to kind of go above. And really, we believe, you know, if it is used in fuel cells, there will be, you know, no emissions. These are low temperature, typically processes, especially if you're looking at a uh, truck and, and the equipments around the ports. Uh, and even at the, the higher temperatures in a fuel cell, you're not going to be generating the NOx. Uh, in combustion, you could be generating some NOx, and there's some different technologies out there to minimize that. Uh, and then even if you don't minimize that, to, to capture it. Uh, I think really what we need to do is, is and what we plan would plan to do in any kind of large deployment is make sure that we're monitoring things like leakage rates and understand them. Uh, we don't see that necessarily um, in terms of technologies out there that the leakage rates are going to be that high. Uh, and we believe that, that you can uh, monitor it and successfully understand what's going to happen in terms of any ancillary uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, but definitely it is somewhat early stages, but we have a very good handle and a very good idea that, that we don't see this as going to be any kind of a huge increase, definitely no increase, and, and probably a very substantial decrease uh, in any kind of greenhouse gas uh, effects. Thank you. Uh, if, if it's truly green hydrogen, the fuel cells emit only vapor, correct? Yeah. All right. That's correct. The, the only emission would, would be water. Yeah. Uh, this, my last question is for our academic partners in NREL. Uh, there have been a number of studies cited when it comes to hydrogen. What serious efforts are there at our institutions of higher learning in partnership with the federal government? 
so I could probably take this phone. Uh, our colleague who's not here today, uh, and by the way, I'm Eric Hook from uh, UCLA. Our, our colleague who's not here today, Jack Brower, runs uh, the National Fuel Cell Research Center at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, in addition, we have a hydrogen energy research consortium at UCLA and uh, a number of active uh, researchers looking at everything from uh, production, uh, compression, storage, uh, trans transmission, uh, and, and utilization. Uh, we probably don't have enough people working on uh, what happens if you build it. Uh, and I think that that's where in the intervening time between now and, and you know when hubs would begin to kick off, we should be talking amongst ourselves about what kind of uh, answers to que what questions do we need to get answers to and commission some studies uh, to try to get those answers as soon as possible. And that way, when we do meet with the community organizations, uh, anyone who's concerned about the use of hydrogen will have intelligent science-based answers uh, to provide for them. Great. Th that's very helpful. I appreciate that. I can expand uh, quickly just yes. about that. So I'm, I'm at Berkeley Lab, so I, I represent a little bit of federal research on, on this side as well. And we're very much tied to, you know, doing research, especially like NREL on hydrogen technologies. Um, we're a little bit focused definitely on California since we're located in California and run by the University of California. And the UC is trying to act as a very much a convener for a lot of these issues of looking around hydrogen use perhaps in the state uh, and what it would be looking like for, for um, deployments within the state. And we would, you know, obviously are, are very tied closely towards the EJ community, understanding what's going to happen when we start deploying hydrogen, uh, whether it's LA um, or, or across the whole federal system of, of interconnected hydrogen hubs. And like Labor mentioned, we, we would love to, to, you know, have a, and utilize a, and really enhance what, what LA is planning by locating it within some state initiatives uh, for hydrogen hubs and hydrogen interconnections. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kretz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have so many comments and questions, but I think at this late hour, I'm going to dispense with most of them. Um, I will note that I wasn't that comfortable with how the department seemed to spring its green hydrogen efforts on us. We created a climate emergency mobilization office to vet and discuss climate policies and not to have them just announced and expect the uh, affected communities to fall in line. So why didn't we go through the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office to, uh, to vet this? I can speak to that unless uh, yes, others Jason, would like to jump ahead. in. Um, so we, as as I mentioned, through the LA 100 effort, uh, had an advisory group of 40 representatives uh, from the city, uh, from uh, outside of the city. So that included council offices, that included academia, that included environmental advocates, community-based organizations, and many others. And so what the importance of that was that so that those leaders in the city uh, could understand the extraordinary complexity of power planning. So understand the nuances of this, that that this goes, reaching 100% goes well beyond uh, just adding solar and wind. That's a big part of it. And in fact, that's most of it. But there are complexities when you go from 99 to 100% renewable energy. And so through that effort, um, we uh, made sure that the advisory group not only uh, was aware, but played a really big part in the feedback through that effort. We're doing the same thing with the steering committee on the uh, strategic long-term resource plan. That's our power plan. SEMO uh, is a part of that effort. Uh, we did uh, present uh, last year on the LA100 efforts uh, with, uh, with respect to hydrogen, with respect to reliability and resiliency. Uh, we also did community outreach uh, as well as part of the LA100 effort. Uh, as part of the equity strategies effort, uh, we also convened a, a steering committee and advisory committee of community-based organizations, and environmental justice organizations. And we also presented um, and got feedback uh, through that effort as well uh, with respect to LA100 Next Steps, including uh, modernizing our generation. So I say all that to say that we've done some work, but 
there is a lot of work to do. And that includes continuing to engage CMO, continuing to figure out ways that we can bridge the gap between a lot of the comments that you heard today uh, about questions. And these are some of these questions we have answers to today, which we, we can bridge that gap right now. Some of the questions will need to be answered as part of this, will need to be answered as part of our partnerships with the National Renewable Labs, with the UC system and, and others. Um, so there is work to be done here, but I don't want it to be lost on anybody that a significant amount of years have been invested in bringing a lot of these local leaders uh, uh, into the fold to make sure they're not just aware of this and they're not learning about this at the very end. They're integrated into the process. They are part of the process. Um, but again, I will emphasize, we know the work is not done on that. We know that when, when the solicitation comes out and when we start to envision what this project will look like, not just for LADWP, but for the city as a whole, there will be significant work to do, uh, not just to, to get buy-in for the proposal, but to actually shape the proposal as well. And you'll continue to work with the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office as that happens. We absolutely will. Okay. And just one opinion, I, I'm, I can see exploring this if we use it primarily to uh, move heavy equipment industries away from fossil fuels sooner, like at the port, I understand how, uh, how that would make sense. I hope that right after voting for uh, clean buildings and not having uh, uh, you know, carbon in, in our buildings, we don't turn around and, and introduce hydrogen to our buildings. Uh, I think that would be that would be problematic. So I would certainly discourage that. And then a couple more questions. Uh, I'd be hesitant to support a system that uses hydrogen mixed with quantities of natural gas or methane. Um, so I'm hoping we define green hydrogen as exclusively only hydrogen produced through uh, uh, electrolysis powered by truly renewable energy sources. So uh, I wouldn't want to see us do it uh, by including uh, reforming or refining fossil fuels or purposely grown feedstocks or any of that. So can anyone assure me that any proposal relating to green hydrogen will minimize or eliminate incineration and the effects of incineration in order to protect public health and welfare and will only include uh, completely green hydrogen. Yeah, I think our, our whole focus of a green hydrogen hub is just exactly that, uh, council member, that, that it is focused on, on, uh, on green hydrogen produced from renewable energy. Um, that's uh, the mandate that the motion tells us to do that. That's how we as, as a department envision it. Um, and that's how we uh, expect to fully uh, move forward. Um, and, and I think that moving forward, uh, those outreach uh, discussions that you talked about, about are going to continue um, and will be a, a really good way uh, to make sure that everyone is vetting that and, and overseeing that and making sure that moving forward, um, we're all talking about the same green hydrogen. And uh, I, I'm also concerned that it doesn't sound like we've totally nailed this down, that uh, uh, there won't be, be NOx leakage that uh, could wind up impacting some surrounding communities, uh, which is exactly the last thing we want to do in communities where air pollution is already uh, worse than, than in most of uh, their areas. And... Um, you know, also what, what amount of hazardous waste is created? Uh, are existing gas pipelines able to carry hydrogen? Do we need to upgrade them? Uh, what's, what's the plan for all of that? I think I can address the question on, on Knox. It's uh, an important one, and, and I think it's related to a question earlier. Um, we know from the LA 100 study that the vast majority of the contributors to local air quality emissions, NOx, is coming from buildings, coming from uh, uh, transportation sector, and a, a small uh, and any contribution is is significant, but a small contribution from uh, the existing natural gas usage today. Now, what we're talking about with LA 100 study is a forecasted usage of hydrogen that would be about one thirtieth 
of the NOx emissions uh, that are produced today with respect uh, to natural gas. So again, a 30th, uh, uh, one thirtieth of the contribution today, which today is also a really insignificant, a really uh, small portion of the contributions uh, today. And again, the 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 vast contributor is to uh, is from transportation and buildings. Um, with respect to pipelines, there might be others on this call that could better answer if existing pipelines could be utilized. Uh, my understanding is no, uh, that they would not be uh, capable, uh, although there may be experts from either NREL or UCs that could better answer that question. I, I can respond to that a little bit. There, that is an ongoing research effort in terms of understanding at what point are natural gas pipelines uh, can they use hydrogen and at what point can they not? Uh, there's a lot of questions, it's not just the pipeline itself, but it's also obviously the valves, the welding connections, all of those are big questions as are the appliances at the end. So uh, in most cases, I, with today's knowledge, I'd recommend no to go fully exclusive, but there may be in necessary points in the future, uh, the ability to be able to convert existing pipelines over on a limited basis. And, and I have one last question. Uh, uh, my understanding is that hydrogen hubs would use a considerable amount of water. And given that uh, we may be in a once in a thousand year level of drought, and that uh, uh, doesn't show any sign of dissipating anytime soon, and may just continue to get worse under climate change, um, how much water would a hub use? And where would the water come from if our supplies continue to become shorter and shorter? I think I can answer from LNUP's perspective. Uh, this is definitely a huge, huge part of what we need to answer. Um, there's things that we know today, uh, and there's things that we're estimating today. One of those things that we're estimating today is that um, with the dramatic reduction in natural gas usage, that would uh, result in a very likely net reduction of water use, meaning the water that's required at the plants, as well as the water that's required to create the hydrogen that we are estimating that there will be a net reduction. Uh, so that is, that is something that is incredibly important for us as well. We're the LA Department of Water and Power. Um, when it comes to sourcing water, there are likely going to be opportunities for things like recycled water or other sources, but a lot of that has to be looked at as part of the overall vision for what a hydrogen hub will look like, and water will be at the forefront of that. Uh, but again, at, from LADPP's perspectives, we're estimating a net reduction in water utilization relative to today. And are you able to uh, place a hub closer to the source of recycled water? Um, so that it would be you know, more more practical to uh, to use that recycled water for this purpose. Where there are opportunities to do that, we would absolutely love to do that. So we will be looking at opportunities to source recycled water where where possible. Uh, we're we're looking at that right now for some of our uh, in basin uh, generators as well. So where there's opportunities to do that, we will look for that. And I, I would think we could try to be more proactive if possible and try to actually cite these uh, in in locations that are water convenient rather than uh, just if it happens to be somewhere in the vicinity. Uh, you know, for instance, if it were located uh, somewhere near Hyperion, obviously that would be uh, more practical for uh, re accessing recycled water than, uh, than many other locations. Some of the issue too is is that you have to be both where there's water and where the renewable energy is, and so that's the juxtaposition there. And so the renewables are in the desert, or there's less water, uh, and so you have to put those two pieces together as well. So I mean, there's a lot of studies that are still going on, and opportunities potentially out out, out in the desert where there are non-potable sources of water very deep in the ground. So those are things that will continue to advance as we continue to push uh, the ball forward and engage with other partners. Uh, especially in the private sector that are looking at opportunities here to supply the market. But likeliness is, is where the renewables are is probably where the source and storage needs to be as, as well. So you need to find the water in that location. 
Makes sense. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just, uh, Mr. Koretz, I just want to uh, refer you to the motion itself where green hydrogen is mentioned seven times, no fewer than seven times, where one of the instructions is for the Department of Water and Power and Port of Los Angeles to work with the SEMO office to ensure frontline communities uh, at large and in specific LA neighborhoods have a, uh, a voice and a seat at the table. And then in the final moving clause, it uh, deals with the water issue that you're mentioning. So the motion is very, very comprehensive and very clear. Uh, and I hope that that will allay some of your concerns. Uh, this is completely and totally about green hydrogen and nothing else. Uh, and with that, Mr. Uh, Dr. Pickle, you would like to have some comments? Yes, uh, two facts and then an opinion. Uh, first fact is uh, there is a wastewater treatment facility that is part of sanitation's operations at Terminal Island, and it has a network of purple pipe in the area uh, supplying uh, one and perhaps soon more industry, um, uh, in addition to the water replacement district uh, of Southern California. Um, so there are opportunities there on the recycled water front. Um, two, uh, the harbor area has a web of old underused pipelines that were used for moving residual oil uh, to generators uh, before oil was uh, was uh, abandoned for uh, generation use. Uh, that network still exists in varying forms. Uh, it, uh, I know from experience on the gas side, you wouldn't want to put natural gas in an old residual oil pipeline uh, without a lot of re uh, revamp. Uh, and certainly hydrogen wouldn't work without a revamp, but those right-of-ways and the permits for cross uh, river and other crossings are valuable in and of themselves. So uh, we shouldn't neglect the existing pipeline structure, both natural gas and water, uh, and other types of pipeline in the harbor area. Um, those are two facts. And then the opinion is, are we making the tent big enough on collaboration? Uh, do we want to be in competition with other uh, players that might be proposing something similar uh, for the harbor area? Uh, would, do we increase our chances of success by bringing more, including possibly some more major players, under the tent? Thank you, Dr. Pickle. Uh, I'm going to read the last moving clause in the motion directly related to item four. I further move that the Department of Water and Power with the collaboration of the Bureau of Sanitation, the Port of Los Angeles, report to council with recommendations on the usage of advanced treated water from the Bureau of Sanitation's advanced water purification facility at the Terminal Island Water Reclamation Plant in order to supply ultra purified water, a high quality water for projects resulting from a successful federal grant application and that the Bureau of Sanitation in collaboration with the Department of Water and Power and the Port of Los Angeles report back on NOx and other emission monitoring for projects resulting from a, a successful federal grant application. So I feel pretty confident that the instructions are clear, that the work in collaboration uh, is, is crystal clear, that this is solely and completely about green hydrogen generation and again, let's not lose sight of the communities most impacted at the port, the residents who live at the Port of Los Angeles and Wilmington uh, and suffer the worst effects of, of uh, the, the pollution uh, caused by our current practices that are uh, wholly and solely generated from fossil fuels. So I just wanted to you know, remind everyone that this is an all-in focus, and uh, I think we're in pretty good hands uh, so far. And with that, uh, any other questions or comments? All right. Well, I think that uh, that pretty much does it. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, with that, Mr. Verano, Mr. Clerk, do we have anything before this committee? The desk is clear, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me just take a moment again to thank everyone uh, for your time and your 
exceptional work and reporting um, on these important matters. Uh, it's not lost on me and, and the dedication uh, to make this happen. And then uh, all the advocacy in, in keeping everything that we do in check uh, just to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and we have an all-inclusive, transparent uh, approach uh, to this very important endeavor. Uh, and, and we must not allow anything to sidetrack us from this imperative to clean energy by 2035. And with that uh, all, I appreciate it. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.